All right, well, good morning, or actually good afternoon, everyone. My name is Irene Haynes. I'm the first selectman here in East Haddam, newly elected this past November. And I have to say this is probably one of my nicest things that I've had to do today, for sure. Um, I'm pleased to have everyone here today, important dignitaries, our statesmen and our, our, our congressmen, our governor, Ned Lamont. Um, we really appreciate you all here, as well as our um, esteemed staff and um, colleagues from Goodspeed uh, Opera House. Um, it, Infrastructure today in East Haddam is um, as important as anywhere else in Connecticut, and we're happy to have um, any kind of funding and any kind of uh, sources and where that comes from is okay with me. So um, looking forward to hearing more from our senator and our um, deputy commissioner of CTDOT, and I'm going to lead it off to them. Congressman. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. So good afternoon, everyone. and. Um, you know, as, as uh, Irene said, uh, the setting that we're in today is almost kind of an iconic uh, place in Connecticut in terms of just sort of driving home, um, you know, the importance of uh, the infrastructure investment, which became official um, about November 11th when President Biden signed the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, into law, which was, again, a long journey in terms of getting to that point. On November 5th, when the House actually voted to um, adopt the Senate uh, version of the infrastructure bill. Uh, being on the floor that, that night was, was actually pretty um, unique because the, the chamber just exploded into applause, cheering, high fives. Um, and I've been around for a few votes uh, by now, but I have to say the spontaneous, very authentic, um, emotional reaction that took place there was real, and it was really because obviously there was some tension leading up to the vote in terms of how we were going to get to that point. But I think it was also because people recognized that what was happening there was exactly what the American people were looking for, which is to watch in, in real life the two sides actually try and come together and do something big for the country. As President Biden reminded us uh, in the caucus before we voted, when he is talking to world leaders around the country, there is a major question about whether or not America's democracy was really capable of doing big things again. And having that vote take place uh, was, I think, important, obviously, in terms of just, you know, projects that we can talk about here today, but really a statement about our country's ability to, to sort of deal with, you know, important issues like climate change, um, trying to, uh, again, rebalance the struggle between uh, authoritarian government and democratic government, and having that bill pass, go to his desk, get signed into law, um, you know, meant a lot on many, many different levels. Uh, but the most important level that we're going to talk about today is really implementation and how is this going to look here in the state of Connecticut. Last week, on, on November uh, 14th, the U.S. Department of Transportation showed that with the ink barely dry on this law, that the funding is moving out. We had, uh, again, the first allotment for fiscal year 21 go to the state of Connecticut. Uh, it's about $660 million for fiscal year 21. That is a 20% increase than the baseline funding from the prior uh, uh, Transportation Act that was in place, the FAST Act. And what that means for Governor Lamont and the, and the legislators that are here today is that rather than, you know, really trying to just, you know, scrimp and, and stretch dollars to get the, the long overdue list of projects that are so um, in need of repair that we actually now have some, some cushion in terms of getting these projects to move and actually go deeper into the list of unfinished uh, roads and bridges, uh, you know, coastal resilience, uh, dealing with, again, just the, the, the many issues that Connecticut, the state of Connecticut, which is one of the oldest settled states in the country, um, experiences probably more acutely than other parts of, of the U.S. So again, that funding um, went out the door last uh, Wednesday. Um, it's now, uh, for, the, for the roads and bridges, it's now at the U.S. Department of Transportation. We have a list of projects, which again, the to-do list, which uh, now, again, it is just all about execution and implementation. And Governor Lamont, I, who we've talked a number of times since the, the law was passed, uh, understands that, you know, that is critical, that we've really got to show the people of the state that um, we're ready to go. We're, we're ready to, to finally take this um, country, this state's um, need for, you know, moving people, moving goods, um, 
you know, reducing carbon emissions is, is something that is now very much within our grasp. And obviously the bridge behind us, which is 108 years old, um, since I've been in Congress has been a chronic um, issue in terms of calls to the office because of the um, difficulty in terms of uh, sometimes getting the, the bridge to swing. Senator Dodd, who I'm honored to say had this seat many a number of years ago and also I think was taking calls probably even back then in terms of the fact that this 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 bridge um, is, is certainly long overdue um, for for repairs. Uh, it, it's a very exciting time, uh, I think, again, for our state in terms of really uh, going to a, a new higher level in terms of uh, uh, making our economy work um, and making sure that, um, you know, we really can do things smartly so that um, environmental treasures like the Connecticut River and this whole area in eastern Connecticut um, is going to be able to coexist and accommodate the need for, for uh, folks to, uh, again, get to and from work and do it in a way that uh, is sustainable over a longer period of time. One last point on Friday, again, just showing how serious the Biden administration is about moving out on this bill. Uh, the funding came out for airports upgrades, which again is another piece of the infrastructure bill. Obviously that means, you know, Bradley Field got a nice allotment that's there, but also in Eastern Connecticut, whether it was the Danielson Airport, the Groton Airport, or the Wyndham Airport, which again, I think most people have to kind of pinch themselves to remember that those even exist. Again, the, the, they are now going to get long overdue upgrades in terms of making sure that air traffic can get in and out. And who knows, maybe we might start commercial air service down in Groton, which would make my life uh, a lot better in terms of getting to and from uh, Washington. So again, the, the folks who are now really, I think um, where you know, the focus really pivots to from state DOT are, are with us here today. And I'm not gonna yield the, uh, the microphone to Mark Rolf, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Connecticut DOT. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, what an exciting day here. Beautiful vantage point, the bridge in our, in, right behind us. Um, bridge was originally built in 1913 and it's Serve the residents of the state of Connecticut very well over the last 108 years. You know, we've put a lot of investment in it in the past 20 years. Um, the bridge is nearing the end of its service life and it needs a major rehabilitation. And, and that's what this coming project will do. Um, it's, I'm pleased to say it's one of the first projects that's going to be funded with the new infrastructure bill. Um, it's a nearly $60 million rehabilitation of this bridge structure. So. Uh, very happy that uh, we're here today and, and be, be able to talk about this bridge. In addition to this historic bridge, we're also here to talk about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and how that huge investment in transportation, totaling at least $5.4 billion for Connecticut, will impact bridges like the East Haddam Swing Bridge in our transportation system across Connecticut. We would not be here today but for the tireless efforts of Congressman Joe Courtney, he has been an outstanding champion for, in Washington for transportation in this region. He stood with the people of Connecticut on the infrastructure bill, and as a result, we all win. Thank you, Congressman. I think it's fair to say, since this project is 80% federally funded through the infrastructure bill, we would not be here today if it were not for his efforts and the efforts of his colleagues. The Connecticut DOT is ready to take that baton and do our part in this infrastructure marathon. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act includes billions of dollars in federal investments in Connecticut's transportation infrastructure and, the, and its transportation systems. And it makes uh, more than $100 billion in competitive federal transportation grants available for Connecticut to pursue. These critical resources will help advance Governor Lamont's vision to improve the region's rail networks, our rails, our roads and bridges, and put safety and sustainability in the forefront of our efforts. The pa passage of the infrastructure bill will allow Connecticut DOT to advance top priorities, bring aging bridges, many that have outlived their useful life, into a state of good repair, tackle major congestion and safety along our major corridors, and invest in rail infrastructure in Connecticut and along the Northeast Corridor. And while we better connect communities, we can reduce transportation emissions from electrifying bus transit bus fleets to installing public EV charging stations and creating smarter and safer streets for drivers, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Centered in all we do is the health and safety of Connecticut residents, commuters, and travelers. Our focus is about connectivity and people. Simply put, 
We have an opportunity to reshape how people move, where and why, for this generation and the next. You'll see us doing more projects, expanding current projects, and providing more jobs than ever before. This is an exciting moment for Connecticut. I want to thank Governor Lamont for his continuing support of the transportation needs of Connecticut. Connecticut is ready. The DOT is ready. Thank you to our entire congressional delegation. It's time to get to work. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Torrance Downs. I am the Deputy Director at the Lower Connecticut River Valley Council of Governments. Uh, that uh, organization also serves as this region's Metropolitan Planning Organization, and uh, the MPO has its uh, Metropolitan Regional Transportation Plan that includes all our policies, and it includes the projects that uh, we are interested in supporting and have supported. Uh, the projects I think that are uh, most important to us, or at least lead the list of many, uh, would include, uh, for instance, the congressman mentioned uh, the bridge here. Rivercog has supported that project uh, for a number of years. Uh, the Connecticut River Drawbridge is another uh, project that needs to go forward. That was part of a uh, three drawbridge project of going back, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years where uh, the Niantic River Draw and the Thames River Draw have been replaced and completed. Uh, the Connecticut River Draw is well over 100 years old and uh, like this bridge here behind me has hit its uh, difficulties in terms of um, mechanicals and obviously that's an important part of our transportation infrastructure uh, with Amtrak and the shoreline east as well. Um, a project that we have looked toward for a number of years uh, and made applications for is designating Route 9 from the shoreline up to Middletown as a scenic road. Um, uh, that project hasn't always seen wide support, so we're hoping that goes forward. Uh, I think we're interested, or I know we're interested in the uh, I-95 improvements that are necessary and uh, have been looked at for years. And uh, lastly, an important project, uh, and the congressman and, and the governor mentioned this, uh, the Connecticut River is one of our beautiful natural resources. Uh, and this project is, is ecological, but it's also related to infrastructure and, uh, infrastructure and the economy, actually. And that's the problem of invasive plants in the Connecticut River and its coves. And actually, that's a problem throughout waterways in Connecticut and New England, really, and that's the invasive plant hydrilla. And uh, we're looking uh, to use some of these funds uh, to study and eradicate hydrilla in this river. And uh, that's important as infrastructure because uh, there is still commercial boating, but also recreational boating on the river. And uh, recreational boating is a huge part of our economy and the economy of the state in general. So uh, that's just a taste of some of the projects we're interested in. Uh, if you want any more information on that, you can contact uh, River Cog. Uh, you can look at our website and find that information. So uh, finally, uh, we thank Congressman Corey and all his uh, congressional counterparts and colleagues uh, and President Biden for getting this legislation through. Uh, important, important funding that we've needed for years. So uh, thank you very much and I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Hello, I'm Joe Comerford. I'm executive director of the Estuary and Middletown Transit Districts. We're the public transit providers for the Lower Connecticut River Valley. So this uh, dramatic increase in funding comes at a really exciting and critical time for us as a, as a transit operator uh, and also for our, the public transit industry as a whole. So locally, we have been working for the past two years on combining the Middletown and Estuary Transit Districts after completing a study by our Council of Governments uh, that looked at ways to improve public transit for our region. And uh, part of that does require some new facilities to improve the experience for our customers, improve our ability to provide maintenance to our fleet, um, and also just you know, improve our passenger facilities. So uh, right away, uh, the state's already been working hard. Uh, I found out that this week already there's funding on the bonding agenda 
to complete the new maintenance facility up in Middletown that will service both districts' fleets. And there's also funding already to do plans for renovating our 40 plus year old passenger terminal in downtown Middletown. So these are two critical projects to our, our region's public transit users. But also as an industry, you know, this is the first time I, I've been doing this 20 plus years, and it's the first time it's been clear where our, our fuels are going in the future, and that's clearly electric. And so we're starting to see not just large buses be electric, but small buses. And so this is gonna provide a huge boost and speed up by years our conversion over to an all electric bus fleet. And we also found out already that we are getting two buses to start that will operate out of our Milltown garage. Uh, but you know, to have those buses also comes with an infrastructure need. And so this provides funding to develop the infrastructure to charge the buses, uh, both the, you know, our facilities, potentially our passenger terminal. Uh, so it allows that transition to happen far quicker than we otherwise planned it to happen. Uh, we, we really had no plans this year of electric buses and we're really excited to be able to start introducing them and get our fleet converted over quickly. So you know, I really want to thank our uh, representative Courtney, our entire co delegation for the state of Connecticut, but also DOT because they've been moving at rapid speeds to start implementing. And uh, you know, when we are ready to act and implement just as quickly as well. Afternoon. Um, it's great to be here today um, on the Connecticut River on a perfect day. Um, I, I want to uh, especially thank Congressman Courtney. It, it can't be stated um, too often and too much how rare it is for Congress to come together on a bipartisan bill. And I don't mean one or two people from the other side voting uh, with the majority. This was a truly bipartisan effort recognition that the infrastructure of this country needs to be updated. It needs a shot in the arm, <clears throat> like booster shots, by the way. Um, and, and the work that was done to get this over the finish line, the frustration, the difficulty, the compromise, should be an example to all of us about how we should be running our federal government and how, sh how we should be running our state government. So thank you, uh, Congressman Courtney. I uh, want to recognize all the other folks here, Senator Dodd, all the folks from the Goodspeed for coming, for um, maintaining this property in its beautiful condition. Um, I can't think of any better use for money because these are investments in our future. This money will be spent to enhance our infrastructure, improve our environment, improve our economy, and, uh, and move us forward in a way that we couldn't have done it without this help. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm fortunate to represent this district, which is mostly up and down um, the southern part of the Connecticut River. It is by far and away the most beautiful district in the, in the state of Connecticut as far as I'm concerned. I love it. I love living here. I love representing it. And this is uh, just a great time for all of us. Um, under the leadership of the governor, I'm sure this money will be spent very, very well. Um, I do want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Senator Will Haskell, who's here from Fairfield County. He is the chair of the Transportation Committee, and I suspect he'll have some involvement in how this money is being spent, so don't forget his name. He's a very important senator. <laughs> so, and with that, I'd like to introduce our great governor, who's led us through some of the most difficult times, Governor Lamar. I've been asked to uh, introduce uh, Senator Will Haskell. <laughs> Thanks, Governor. I will keep it very, very brief. I th Norm, I thought I represented the prettiest Senate district in the state, but you're giving me a run for my money today. Uh, I just wanted to say I feel so fortunate to be standing here uh, in front of a bridge that was built during Woodrow Wilson's administration. We all happen to have the chance at the federal, state, and local level to be serving in this historic moment when this bridge is finally going to be updated. Uh, here in the state government, obviously Congressman Courtney and, uh, and our federal delegation have done an incredible job sending $5.3 billion. We're going to work so closely together now, the executive and legislative branch, to make sure that this money is spent well. We're going to be looking to do that efficiently. We're going to be looking to do it equitably. And of course, we're going to have an eye towards emissions. And that's why I'm so pleased that this project actually uh, is going to include a pedestrian and cyclist bridge because we know the transportation cannot just be built for cars. Uh, finally, I'll just say that 
I've been going around the state as the transportation chairman, talking to folks about how infrastructure impacts their lives. And when we renovate a bridge, it's not just for the sake of renovating that bridge, it's because it helps people get to work that much sooner. It means less time idling, which means fewer carbon emissions. And most importantly, it means helping people get home at the end of their day and spend more time with their families. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much to Congressman Courtney for bringing us together and to Norm for allowing me to visit his district. And now I have the honor of introducing our exceptional governor, Ned Lamont. All right, thanks, Will. Hey, by the way, um, this is a bit of a wedding present for the chairman of the Transportation <laughs> Committee who announced his uh, engagement this past uh, weekend. Hearts are broken across the uh, country, but um, it's the best we could do. And uh, I'll cut, cut to the chase. You know, we're in one of the most beautiful places in the world, right here, Goodspeed Opera House, overlooking the river. But we can't live on our good looks forever. We got to continue to invest in our future. And uh, that's what this day is all about. You've heard about the 108-year-old um, bridge over there. Um, Chris Dodd and I were there for the ribbon cutting, actually. It was a very moving day. And, uh, but it's about time we, um, we get this fixed up. And you want to do this for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, one is just public safety. 108 years ago. I mean, they didn't even have the Model A back then. It was the Model T. And, um, you know, I'm somebody that, you know, lived near the Mianus River Bridge, and that went down, and I take public safety very seriously. You know, Mark Rolfe just, you know, said, look, we can keep investing in this and fixing it up and doing reforms and doing repairs, but it's costing us tens of millions of dollars, and more and more often we're doing this. It can only put so much uh, lipstick on a pig. Now is the time to replace this bridge and do it safely. Uh, what this bridge symbolizes, what we're doing around the state of Connecticut. We've got a lot of old bridges and a lot of old infrastructure like this. And not only is it gonna be safer, not only does it mean incredibly good paying jobs, what it also means in terms of um, investing in our economic future. I'm told there's some development ideas in and around here that may come to fruition if this bridge is done. And that's true of dozens of other bridges around this state. You know what else those bridges do? They speed up transportation, they open things up. Each and every one of those old hundred year old bridges trains go over, slow up the trains, sort of three or four minutes in each direction. We're gonna be able to fix those up, speed up rail, speed up transportation dramatically. And I just wanna say one other thing, you heard it from Norm and uh, in particular, you know, my friend Joe Courtney. Um, People sometimes worry about government, that we just can't do big things anymore, that we're just too fractured, and we spend a lot of time in public service just treading water. And uh, this is a really big, important investment, one of the most important investments for our state and for our country that we have seen in, um, you know, maybe since Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, it will be transformative for our state in terms of what it means for jobs, what it means for economic development and growth and opportunity. And I'd say that's true across the country as well. And uh, the fact that, um, Joe, as you pointed out, we're able to get this done on a bipartisan basis, you know, just gives you a little help that uh, Connecticut and more importantly, the United States of America can get its act together and do some big things that make a big difference. Um, I, my job, I think, in particular, as somebody who believes in good government, is to show at the end of five, six years, this money made a difference. This investment was well spent. The people are proud of the investments we made, proud of the fact that the money was not squandered, but made a difference in people's lives. And, uh, you know, that's my obligation. Um, as long as I'm around to make sure that we'll be able to look back and say, this state will never be the same again. Thank you. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Question for you or anybody else who once held the second district seating chair. Do you agree with the White House's reaction to Joe Manchin? What is your assessment of how to go forward with the next very large infrastructure package? So the, uh, the Build Back Better uh, legislation, which, uh, as you know, Mark, passed the House um, a couple weeks ago, um, 
you know, is a, is obviously following through on the president's promises during the 2020 election, which is that, you know, as we come out of COVID, you know, we're, we're not going to just sort of uh, turn the clock right back to pre-COVID, that we're actually going to build back better. We're going to try and get some really long overdue issues addressed uh, in this country. And, you know, my, you know, as we saw with the um, infrastructure bill, these, these packages, I mean, are, they're a journey. Uh, the rescue plan was the same thing back in, in March uh, uh, earlier this year. So, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi, uh, you know, put out a statement to the caucus today, which is that, um, you know, regardless of what people think, we, you know, we, our job is to stay focused on getting this, um, these priorities addressed. Um, and, and, and that's really where, that's the approach that I would take. I would just note that for the state of Connecticut in particular, there's a couple of issues here which sometimes don't get a lot of uh, attention, which is number one, for people up in my part of the state, this, the Build Back Better actually has important uh, resources to address the issue of crumbling foundations, which I want to thank the governor and both state senators for the fact that, you know, Connecticut stepped up to try and help these homeowners. There are, there are resources in this bill which is going to help, you know, accelerate that process of fixing people's homes. Number two, it lifts the cap on deducting state and local uh, tax payments, which was imposed during the 2017 uh, tax law. For the state of Connecticut, I mean, if you look at a map, this state took the hit in terms of that cap on state and local um, deductions harder than almost any other part of the country. This is really talking about putting money in people's pockets who are, in many instances, middle class uh, homeowners that was just basically yanked away from them in, in 2017. And the third item, which is in there, which is near and dear to my heart, because, you know, it's it's a big deal in terms of the investments that are coming in from the Navy into this district, which is that it has just eye-watering increases in terms of job training for apprenticeship programs and pre-apprenticeship programs. Right now, down at the shipyard, they've got about 600 openings for really good jobs. But the problem is, is there's a skills gap in terms of people being able to, to connect to those jobs. And as someone who's been on the Education and Labor Committee, which uh, Chris served on for many years, you know, we really have not, as a country, stayed on, on pace with our industrialized, um, you know, uh, partners across the world in terms of investing in job training. And, you know, that would be a tragedy for not just Connecticut, but the country, uh, particularly at this time when there's so many job openings that um, we all hear about, right, from employers, that, that we, we actually have it right in our grasp now to, to really change people's lives and grow our economy in a way which, again, didn't exist pre-COVID. So I, I am saying totally focused on, on helping in any way possible our two senators to get across the finish line. We, we understand, you know, it's the art of compromise, as Senator Needleman said, you know, you don't get 100% in life in any level, uh, and, and that's certainly true in Washington, but I'm not giving up in terms of getting this done. But you can address what those compromises might look like. You know, again, there are so many pieces to this bill. I, I, I really, I, I just laid out three priorities, which I think are really important to this state, and we've obviously got to keep our eye on them. Child daycare is something when I was chairman of the Human Services Committee, <laughs> and these guys, you know, can, can attest to it. I mean, this, this is just a, you know, long overdue issue to address in terms of, by the way, enabling people to go back to work. So, um, but again, you know, it's, you know, doing the hot stove league in terms of, you know, trying to speculate about which pieces stay in and which pieces stay out. I'm going to sort of step back and let everybody take a deep breath after yesterday, and, and then we're going to keep going forward. As I said, we're not giving up. Congressman, do you think it was a misstep by the administration? They knew going in what the price tag was that Mr. Manti was comfortable with, yet they still didn't address it. Well, actually, I, I would say that if you looked at the Congressional Budget Office score when we voted on the bill, we were, we were definitely within shouting distance of the number that Senator Manchin had the signed agreement with uh, Chuck Schumer. So, you know, as I said, you know, we've got people who have been around a few rodeos in terms of getting legislation through, and I think everyone um, is realistic at all ends of the caucus, by the way, from the progressives to the blue dogs, about the fact that what came out of the House, you know, is, is just, you know, not going to be 
unscathed in terms of the negotiating process. So I, I actually think there's a higher degree of pragmatism and optimism about the fact that we can get this done.